Many thanks, Joanna. To fill in some more background, I've got two main roles of the Europa Nostra. I'm a newly elected trustee of the Europa Nostra UK branch. My second role is that for several years, I've been committee secretary of the EN Industrial and Engineering Heritage Committee. And of course, I'm also an individual member of EN. Today's webinar is linked to the publication of a new book by Europa Nostra, led by the Industrial Heritage Committee, in collaboration with the Krems Danube University in Austria, with the same title as the webinar, Industrial and Engineering Heritage of Europe. As my colleague Paul Smith will explain, this celebrates the achievements of 50 Industrial Heritage winners of the European Heritage Awards, over the period 2002 to 2020. The new book is primarily intended as an e-book and is accessible for reference or download of the whole book from the publications section of the main EN website. And the link will be in the, uh, the chat um, column on this webinar. A very limited number of hard copies will also be available. And again, details of purchase arrangements will be announced on the EN website shortly. So that's enough from me, and I'll now hand over to our main presenter for the afternoon, Paul Smith, the research officer of the EN Industrial Heritage Committee and a lead member of the editorial team. Thank you very much, Paul. And thank you, uh, Joanna. Good afternoon, everybody. I trust that you can hear and see me loud and clear. Although, if you're all nodding your heads vigorously and giving me encouraging thumbs up signs, uh, I'm none the wiser. As Peter has just explained, the pretext for this afternoon's web seminar is the publication of this book, an anthology of 50 award-winning projects on the industrial and engineering heritage coming from 19 different European countries. Uh, a selection then, a sort of top 50 of what might be considered as good practice where this heritage is concerned. This afternoon, however, I thought it might be more interesting to look at some industrial heritage sites through a slightly different analytical framework. I want to look at the state of conservation or non-conservation in which the physical legacy of industrial activity reaches us today before it can be studied, protected and given awards, diplomas or medals. Several categories then uh, that I would like to sketch out very briefly uh, during uh, this seminar, beginning with this one which, as you can see from the title, I have called Gone and Forgotten. Obviously, it's a difficult category to illustrate, but the picture shows uh, an, a statistical analysis of industrial establishments in a French department in about 1860, providing the names of these establishments, the type of production they were involved in, the number of workers, the number of uh, steam engines. But that is all it tells us. And there are no addresses so that we can go and look to see if there are surviving buildings or landscapes or machines. They are, so to speak, phantom factories or, or ghost factories. It's important to note, however, that statistically speaking, this is a, a well-stocked category. Dereliction, abandonment, uh, fires, floods, earthquakes, wars, destruction uh, to make way for new building, the disappearance of the built physical heritage of industry, as for other types of uh, heritage, is a common fate, perhaps akin to the fate of uh, animal species, where I'm led to believe about 99% of the planet's animal species uh, are extinct today. A second category is gone but not forgotten. And here an illustration, which is the well-known Euston Arch in London, which was uh, built in 1838 for the arrival of the London-Birmingham Railway at Euston in London, 
but which was demolished with the authorization of the then Prime Minister Harold, Harold Macmillan in 1961. And according to one of its pioneers, Angus Buchanan, industrial archaeology was born as a result of the public outrage at this wanton act of official vandalism. If London and England was undoubtedly the birthplace of the railway revolution, the motor car revolution, the automobile revolution was born in France and in particularly in Paris. And here we have a photograph of about 1948, which shows the huge Renault car factory uh, to the west of Paris in the suburb of boulogne billancourt This site, which dates back to 1898 and which covers the whole of the century of industrial car production, there is nothing left of it today except the shape of this island, the Ile Seguin, and this bridge here, the Pont d'Ede, which spans this branch of the River Seine. But this factory is extremely well known and extremely well documented. Uh, there is a huge bibliography of sociological, technical, historical studies on the factory, one of the leading factories in France, and, as I can suggest here, a photo library of something like 420,000 photos showing the buildings, the machines, the workers, and of course, the products of this exceptional factory. And in 2005, the demolition of this factory, or what was called its deconstruction, was also carefully documented. Indeed, in the process of being demolished, in course of demolition, perhaps this is another subcategory that concerns the industrial heritage, although it's an aspect of the industrial heritage, which as far as I know, is little studied. The next category I want to look at, another difficult one to illustrate, is, is called not yet recognized as heritage. Uh, places where industrial activity is carried out, where work takes place, but where people don't think of themselves or others don't see them as working in places of heritage interests, of interests of a technical or architectural nature. The illustration here is of a coal mine in Serbia, which I had the pleasure of visiting some years ago, and which is a working coal mine, working indeed with this uh, mine shaft here down which uh, I was invited uh, to pay a visit. And when we came out, we went to look at the uh, steam engine which drove the winding gear for this, uh, for this mine shaft, a steam engine dating from 1878 and built in Austria. I say not yet recognized as heritage, but a point, in point of fact, since I visited this place, uh, it has been probably protected by the Serbian cultural authorities, and there is a project afoot to make of it an eco museum, an open air site museum with European support. Perhaps this category of not yet fully recognized as heritage is better illustrated by this small backyard workshop in a suburb near Paris at Aubervilliers. The chimney was probably for a scalding tanks used to scald off the, the, the remains on bones from the local meat market. But the kind of workshop place which is not particularly appreciate its heritage, which has not been studied, which is not, uh, which is not enhanced, as, as, as they say, but which, of course, is an important part of the industrial urban tissue in Paris, in large cities, and in other suburbs throughout Europe. And another feature of this not yet recognized as heritage category is perhaps the buildings, which are very recent industrial sites, but which do not yet, uh, because there is no longer the, not yet the distance in time for their recognition, which are not yet seen as heritage. But here, the example I show is a building uh, by the well-known uh, British architect Norman Foster, and which may, in a sense, be viewed as instant heritage. 
uh, buildings by such star architects as Norman Foster, uh, Renzo Piano or, or Jean Nouvel in France, uh, are heritage practically as soon as they see the light of day. The next, uh, the next category I would like to suggest uh, is the category of industrial ruins, uh, illustrated here with a couple of engine houses in Cornwall, uh, the United Kingdom's tin and copper mining landscape, which was uh, listed as a, a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 2006. What is important, I think, about industrial ruins, there are two points which make it particularly important. First of all, of course, it's aesthetic and, and romantic appeal. Uh, ruins, industrial ruins, appeal to photographers, to filmmakers, to the makers of video clips. Uh, and there are any number of books that are published these days on abandoned places, uh, abandoned ruins, the ruins, secret places, and so on. And the, and the internet is full of such places. And these places appeal then to our sensibilities and they sometimes inspire as well historical research. We want to know what took place before these places became ruins. And also it is a fairly characteristic state for the industrial heritage to find itself in. Another example here, less well known, uh, a railway roundhouse near Berlin. But this characteristic state for the industrial heritage is of course one that cannot be sustained, it is not sustainable. If the building is given statutory, statutory protection and preserved and restored and given new uses, it will of course lose this uh, romantic decaying appeal that it has. Uh, and of course, if it is le left alone, sooner or later, it will return to dust and rust. These are places, incidentally, which, as you know, are very frequently uh, places of street art, of uh, graffiti art, although not all of it of the quality of a uh, Banksy. Another ruin here, but this is a ruin which is preserved, so to speak, as part of a museum. It is a, a remarkable site of cement works, which cascades down a mountainside in Catalonia. At the foot of the works, there is a proper museum explaining the production, the industrial production and the uses of cement, of Aslan cement. But the, the, the ruined factory itself is left as is. A solution which has also been used at the well-known Volklingen Iron Works in Germany, one of the earliest sites of industrial interest to be listed by UNESCO in 1994, but where there are parts of the site which, once again, are being left just to be overgrown with vegetation and to disappear over time with rust, which, as we know, never sleeps. In France, there is a similar project to let nature take its course on this fairly remarkable coal preparation plant, a coal washery uh, near Monsolimine, dating from the 1920s. Uh, it was originally given statutory protection as a historic monument in 2000, but no solution has been found for its preservation or for its conversion. And indeed, inside the building is no more than a machine. A lot of, a lot of 20th century industrial archeology span and industrial heritage sites are in fact machine buildings or building machines, which it is very difficult to transform into universities or hotels or whatever. So this is the category of, of, of ruins. And once again, I think it is an important category for all of us who are interested in the industrial heritage. The next category is, is a much uh, smaller one. Uh, and I would say it is rather special, it's replicated industrial spaces. What I mean here, a bit like uh, the French architect Viollet-le-Duc, who would restore buildings to a state 
that he thought they ought to have had, rather than the state they might have had, uh, a replica, such as the spire on Notre Dame Cathedral, of a heritage which in fact had never existed. And now in the field of uh, industrial sites, of course, this is very rare, but some of the mining sites, and this is a mining museum in the north of France at Leward, if they want to show us what underground galleries were like, uh, uh, how they were constructed and reinforced, and how coal was extracted from the coal face, they have to build surface buildings. It is now, in this particular uh, coal mining basin, it is now impossible to do underground visits. But overground ones can be organized in order to explain uh, features of the coal mining industry. And this is the building, as you can see below, where this uh, gallery, where this exhibition gallery is housed today. It's possible too to think of uh, one of our um, prize winning sites published in the book, which is the remarkable uh, ship designed by uh, Brunel, the uh, Great Britain, one of the first uh, ocean going liners with uh, propeller propulsion where the story of its recovery and, and transformation into a museum is a truly remarkable one, well worthy of all the prizes one, one can imagine, but where much of the structure today, apart from the iron hull of the ship, is re a replica, uh, a, a model, a full-scale model, such as the uh, machine here, the steam engines which drove the propeller, and where it is very important for visitors to make it clear that this is a replica, this is not the original. Otherwise, it is possible, and in some sites this does exist, it's possible to fall in, into what we can call a fake heritage. Only a small uh, category then, a much larger category, is the category of reused industrial spaces. And indeed, from the emergence of the interest in industrial architecture and industrial sites, which we can date in Great Britain from the 1960s and in other European countries, probably from the 1970s, the idea of what was called adaptive reuse was one of the main ways in which former industrial buildings could be preserved that their, their values uh, of, of, of showing what workplaces were like formerly could be kept even if the machines, more often than not, had already disappeared. And indeed, uh, adaptive reuse is generally applied to industrial buildings which are long since been emptied of all their machinery. This is a, a precocious example in uh, France, it was a late uh, 19th century textile mill, the Le Blanc mill, and which was transformed into social housing in about 1980 by a well-known team of French architects, uh, Robert and uh, Reichen. Reusing old industrial buildings is of course part of a, a long history of reusing old buildings. There is nothing particularly novel about a, a built, a built uh, monument receiving a new occupation. One has to think only of townhouses becoming ministries or, uh, or royal palaces becoming museums. But during the 1970s and 1980s, obviously, of course, where the industrial heritage was concerned, this approach, adaptive reuse, came to be seen as one of the main ways of preserving something of our industrial past. And since the 1980s, this, this approach of taking care of old buildings and finding new uses for them, which do not destroy the messages that they can uh, transmit. This has also become uh, an advantageous kind of policy where environmental considerations are concerned. Obviously, keeping an old building and restoring it to a new uses with new economic uh, viability is a key way of keeping our industrial heritage and one that has become very important. One, of course, that is often uh, put forward 
for the Europa Nostra uh, prizes. Here, another example, still within this category of adaptive reuse, the remarkable Rotterdam factory of Van Nella, which uh, was involved in the production and conditioning of colonial products such as coffee, tea, and tobacco. Uh, I did manage to get one tobacco factory into this show. This has been this remarkable 1920s daylight factory has been lovingly transformed into office space and event space. And uh, on the top right hand, what you can see is the office space of the architect uh, Vessel de Jong, who's, who was responsible for this uh, remarkable conversion. Office space is a fairly frequent new use for old industrial buildings. And here we have a couple of other of the sites uh, which have received awards over the last 20 years and which feature in our recent publication. Here on the left at Tilburg in the Netherlands is a former railway maintenance works which has been restored in order to house an event space uh, and a cultural center and I believe a, uh, a library. And on the right we can see at Leuven in Belgium the former De Horn brewery of 1923, a brewery which similarly has been transformed into office space, uh, an event space and also a restaurant. And this commemorates, of course, uh, the uh, important uh, brewing industry, which was one of the key industries of Leuven. Former industrial buildings often lend themselves too to their use as university accommodation. And here is another example from France in Mulhouse, the building known as La Fonderie, the foundry, which was built in 1928 and which was a foundry for the cast iron parts, essentially of textile machinery of the firm, uh, that's the Société Alsacienne de Construction Mécanique. This is an example of how university accommodation, lecture halls, meeting rooms, seminar rooms can be fitted quite nicely into former industrial buildings. Because one of the problems with reconversion is, of course, finding an appropriate architectural future for the buildings, an architectural future which is, do not, does not interfere too much with the volumes and the morphology of the existing building. Trying to put a complicated modern program, a housing is an example, into existing industrial space is often a challenge and one that can denature, which can destroy the heritage value of the existing places. Amongst these uh, former industrial sites, which have been transformed into new places, uh, the example of museums is, of course, a vital one. Uh, very important and uh, impossible here not to make mention of the Tate Modern at London, transformed uh, by the architects uh, Herzog and de Meuron. A building dating from the 1950s, uh, not that old in point of fact, uh, my uncle, who was a civil engineer, actually worked for McAlpines on the building of this power station. Herzog and de Meuron, the uh, architects of this uh, conversion project, were very clear that they were not involved in an industrial archaeology ex exercise. And in point of fact, the, the magnificent space of the turbine hall on the right, which can receive uh, large sized or environmental works of art, there is nothing to remind the visitor today of why this huge space existed. None of the turbines have been kept to show why this turbine hall had this huge volume and its overhead gantry cranes. This, of course, is one of the problems in the reconversion operation is preserving 
pieces of machinery or pieces of structure which help explain to visitors why this building has been kept and what its industrial past involved. Another poor example, in my view, is the well-known uh, Musée d'Orsay in Paris, a former railway station dating from 1900, but where visitors can leave it today, it's now, of course, the Museum of 19th Century Art, visitors can leave it today without realizing that it was a former railway station. Another former industrial space uh, converted into a museum, uh, if you have a chance to visit this in Rome, I recommend it highly. It is the Centrale Montemartini, a 1920s electricity generating station built by the engineer Montemartini. And where all the power producing machinery, these huge diesel engines, has been kept, but the museum itself is a museum of, of classical Roman uh, archaeology and statues. And as you can see, the two, in my view, marry together very well. And there are two kinds of heritage which come together to the enhancement of both. Of course, many former industrial sites, when they are transformed into museums, become museums of themselves. That is to say, they are kept more or less as site museums, uh, made accessible to the public and used to explain former industrial activities to their visitors. And amongst our 50 prize winning sites, several of these sites have uh, been included. This is one in Poland, the Queen Louise, Louise had it. I'm sorry, I left the left the E off the Louise. Uh, a mining, a coal mine first opened in Upper Silesia in 1791 and which uh, over 15 or so years has been progressively converted in order to become a museum of coal mining. One in which fairly exceptionally it is possible to visit underground workings because these were adits going horizontally into the ground and not vertically. Another industrial site that has become a museum of itself, so to speak, one of my favorites is in Athens. Huh? Athens, here the Technopolis Gasworks Museum, but a stone's throw from the Acropolis, although throwing stones from the Acropolis is now strictly forbidden, it is a gasworks which was originally created in Athens in the capital when Athens became the capital of Greece in the 1850s and a remarkable site partly because it survived so long in its more or less 19th century state up until 1986 when it was closed and it has kept all its retorts. Uh, you can see the retorts on the right here. These are all intact and explained. And uh, so this is a, an exceptional gas works, which shows how gas was produced throughout Europe. There are similar structures throughout Europe, including this gas holder, which is a particular interest because it was built by a French firm. This is a striking example of how industrial sites throughout Europe bring together for different reasons, various reasons, bring together strands of European history, which make of Europe the first industrial continent. This is a, a project we have with our Industrial and Engineering Heritage Committee, is to select a certain number of industrial heritage sites which illustrate the European aspects of industrialization. It is all the more striking, this uh, gas holder, since uh, gas holders in France no longer exist. There is not a single gas holder in France to be seen. Uh, and it is in Athens that you can visit this French one. We come now to the last category that I want to look at with more, once again, with examples taken from the uh, Europa Nostra Industrial and Engineering Heritage publication. Places which are in activity, which maintain their activity, but which can also be visited as museums. And this, as you can imagine, and for many 
friends and colleagues in the field of industrial archaeology, this is the, the best solution, the best outcome for a place of industrial heritage. Of course, where transport heritage is concerned, and here we have the example of Antwerp Central Station, where transport heritage is concerned, this is fairly frequent. Amongst the prize winners, uh, we have um, the high level bridge at uh, Newcastle. We also have Glasgow Station and here Antwerp Central Station, which was built at the beginning of the 20th century, a real railway cathedral, which was transformed into a through station by digging underground levels for high speed 21st century trains, whilst completing the, whilst retaining and enhancing the surface levels with its extraordinary, with their extraordinary decoration. King's Cross is another example in London, the magnificent 1850s building with its new uh, concourse designed by the architect John McCaslin. This new Western cons concourse where you feel as though you are beneath a, a fountain and where if you are a Harry Potter fan, you can go and see the Harry Potter uh, place where he, he, he left King's Cross Station. And where, of course, uh, the uh, creation of this new concourse on the St Pancras site means that the original train sheds are all preserved. An example of how railway stations throughout Europe, and in particular the, the mainline stations in capitals, are preserved and have become places which uh, attract passengers, but also visitors who can appreciate the history of the places as they pass through on their journey. There are, however, and, and these are the last examples I would like to show from uh, our publication or from elsewhere, there are also a certain number of factories which are still in operation, but which can also be visited as museums. This is one I'm particularly keen on, which is in France, uh, which was set up in the 1880s as a, a wire drawing factory. And as you can see, it was partly uh, a water powered factory uh, with subsequent addition of steam power. And it was a factory which from war dra wire drawing went on to the production of pins and needles. And indeed, Boin, Fabrication Française, this is a, well, a worldwide known manufacturer of needles and pins and safety pins, uh, uh, still, op still active today. What is interesting, however, is that you can visit it like a museum. And here, for example, the museum design by François Confineau takes you through the workshops, uh, uh, allows you to see people at work, uh, to talk with them, uh, and of course, uh, at the end of the visit, to exit through the gift shop. Another such uh, site, uh, once again, from our uh, award-winning prizes, the 50 sites in Europe, this one in the Basque country, the Salt Valley of Añana in the Basque country in Spain, where salt has been made apparently for over 6,000 years. And this site with its remarkable landscape was given an award some years ago. Coming back to Britain, there is another site, which is the Middleport Pottery. This is Britain's last working Victorian pottery built in 1888 and where the famous Burley pottery is made. This site was threatened with closure and uh, was saved uh, thanks to the uh, Prince of Wales Regeneration Trust and now is a place which can be visited. It's one of these destinations for a great day out where one can see people at work and where, of course, you can buy burly pottery and where these characteristic bottle ovens are still preserved. And the last one, this is the last slide I want to show, which is uh, partly uh, for Peter. This is a Scottish site, the uh, Knockandu wool mill, 
which has been making uh, woolen uh, materials since uh, the late 18th century, which was recently restored to full working order and where some of the machines are mid 19th century and where the site is still in active production. So these then are some of the categories that I would like to suggest, I mean, there is nothing official about them, some of the categories of the way industrial heritage can be seen today, can be visited, can be discovered, and can be analyzed before it is protected, before it is restored, uh, before the owner or an architect decides that they're going to submit it for a Europa Nostra prize, and before the Europa Nostra juries decided, decide that the place is worthy of a prize. If you are interested in uh, the publication, as Peter said at the outset of this talk, you can quite simply download it from the Europa Nostra site under the rubric publications. And uh, if, if it uh, gives you a suggestion of places to go and visit in the future when uh, the idea of travel will cease to be a thing of the past, that will be, in my view, a positive outcome. Thank you very much for your attention. And now uh, Joanna has returned to my screen. Hello again, Joanna. And maybe uh, you will have some questions for me, which I would be delighted to try and answer. Thank you once again. Paul, well, thank you so much for the most fascinating talk and for taking us all around Europe in these times when travel is somehow restricted. It's even more valuable today. Uh, I'm just now looking at the question area. We have lots of people from all over the world who are commenting during your talk and you know sharing experience and uh, we've learned a lot from the chat as well. Uh, a question from Peter Veikli, a beautiful delivered talk, thank you Paul, given problems of finance for preservation of or adaptation, the ruin approach may be increasingly important, but how do sites become safe and acceptable to local communities? Monsolemin looks like a challenging example. It, it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to have a question about Monsolemin because indeed it raises all sorts of difficult questions about how to keep the industrial heritage. Uh, paradoxically, when the coal washery closed down in about uh, in the year 2000, the local community wanted to see it disappear. The local authorities, Monsolimin, at that time, were thinking of changing their name to become Monsolélac or Monso en Bourgogne. Why? Because the whole of the mining history of Monso seemed to be a, so a story of, of failure, of economic failure. It had come to the end of its career and the time was ripe to turn over a new leaf and move on to new activities. And so the idea of keeping this uh, rusting giant building in the landscape did not appeal to the local community. Subsequent, and, and, and it must be added here that the protection of this building as a historic monument under the terms of French legislation on historic monuments was a decision taken in Paris, quite simply because this was the last coal washery in France. Over the last 20 years, there has been a subsequent, there has been a, a remarkable change in attitudes on the part of the local community. There have been studies on what can be done with this building. There have been a lot of reflection on how to keep parts of it how to let parts of it go back to a natural state with rust and vegetation. And there has, of course, been a lot of thought about the cost of keeping it going. In the long run, this cost of simply maintaining it was seen as uh, prohibitive 
and it was decided a short time ago uh, that the building should be demolished, that there was no possible future for it. But surprisingly, the local authorities then protested, uh, saying, no, 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 it's not possible to demolish this site. This is our local Eiffel Tower. Our identity is concerned. We must find ways of keeping it. Now, it's not possible to disguise the fact that ways of keeping it will be very expensive, but it's a sign of how attitudes towards the industrial past can change with time. And as another example, once again from France, the greatest, the best example of this that I know is the way the coal mining basin in the Nord Pas de Calais became world heritage in 2012. There too, the original attitude to the coal mining heritage was get rid of it. This is a past that we don't want to be concerned with. Uh, it's, it's, it's ugly, it's dirty, it's grimy. But gradually, partly because people started talking about it as a potential world heritage site, the local population began, began to find, find pride in it. They began to realize that this was their identity, this was their past, and if they lost this past, they would lose a vital part of their identity. The North, North Pad Kelly mining basin, unlike other UNESCO sites, has not become a major tourist destination, but it has certainly changed local attitudes. And I think over the past 25 or 30 years, attitudes overall towards the industrial heritage have evolved in a positive manner. I don't think throughout Europe today that the idea of keeping old industrial buildings for their value, for their industrial and technical and architectural value, nobody finds this a, a surprise anymore. But you are perfectly right financing the maintenance and keeping of these buildings, particularly the rusting industrial industrial buildings such as the Lavoir de Chavannes is a tremendous challenge. And um, one Lavoir de Chavannes in France is quite enough. Joanna, another Thank question. You, Paul. We have more and more questions. Uh, obviously people have been so inspired by your talk. A question from Evelyn Miner. Thank you for this clear presentation of different categories of industrial heritage, Mr. Smith, and for the organization UN UK. I was wondering if you have a particular stance towards complete reversibility of contemporary architectural additions to industrial heritage sites. <laughs> it, 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 it's a very good question, and it's a question about the restoration of cultural heritage that, that is, is, is particularly challenging. Uh, it is, of course, the, um, uh, the Venice Charter, which says that um, the restoration of cultural heritage should be legible and reversible. My own position, I'm not an architect, I'm not a restoration architect, I am somebody who is interested in the history of industrial heritage and how it becomes heritage and what happens to it subsequently. It seems to me acceptable that industrial buildings in order to be converted must inevitably be changed. You cannot keep an old industrial building with its smells in particular, smells are things which always disappear, if you want it to earn its keep, to earn its living. And if you change an industrial building into university accommodation or social housing or a museum, it is inevitable that things will be lost. Different architects have different attitudes to the way these things are lost, uh, uh, should, should should they be artificially uh, restored or should they be should it be made clear that something was here before but has now gone or should our new additions uh, uh, be clearly distinguished from what is old quite a few of the uh, prize winners there's one in poland which has become a shopping center were given prizes because there is interesting new architecture 
adapted to the existing industrial structures. My attitude to this is, is it is an extremely difficult question, one of finding a balance between the new and the old, between economic viability and heritage preservation. And it seems to me that each case must be taken on its own merits. One of the lessons I have learned from studying the industrial heritage is that lessons are extremely difficult to reproduce and, and that uh, each site has its own special interest. There is uh, shortly uh, Massimo Prete, who is a friend from Italy, is giving careful thought to this question of uh, how the uh, question of reversibility can be applied to industrial sites. And I think where industrial sites are concerned, it must be recognized that they are not like cathedrals. They are not like 18th or 17th or 16th century heritage and their adaptation can accept change. Uh -huh. Yes, we have another question, or many of them, and many also thank you messages to you and some to Panostra. Thank you, everyone, to be so kind to us. Miles Ogleto, whom I think you may know. Tremendous presentation, Paul. Thank you. I'm sorry, you say, you say Miles Oglethorpe? Is that his name? Miles Oglethorpe. Miles Oglethorpe. Well, it, it, it's a great pleasure to say hello to Miles Overcourt. Yeah, I'm sorry if I yes if I'm messing up with names. Uh, no, no, no. I'm doing my best. Yes. Yeah. Uh, question: Do you think there is an extra argument for the adaptive reuse of industrial buildings because of the embodied energy that can be recycled by not destroying the buildings? For example, helping the battle against climate change. May I, by way of introduction, uh, send my warmest greetings to Miles Oglethorpe, who, as some, as Peter certainly knows, uh, and as some others know, is uh, a well-known figure in industrial archaeology and who is, in fact, the president of the TIKI, which is the International Committee for the Conservation of the Industrial Heritage. And uh, I'm extremely pleased to know that Miles is listening in today, wherever he is, I believe he's not in Edinburgh these days. And your question, Miles, is obviously a vital one in these days where we are becoming increasingly sensitive to the question of uh, sustainable uh, development of environment and so on. And indeed, many industrial buildings have a kind of carbon content represent uh, a, an expenditure of carbon which makes their preservation, which gives it all the more meaning and, and sense. As I said in the chapter, in the opening the section on, on reused industrial buildings, adaptive reuse was first seen as a way of keeping industrial heritage. But today it is also seen as a sensible reaction to urban development keeping existing buildings and giving them new life rather than wasting the energy in demolishing them and building anew is a key aspect of urban development today. And industrial buildings, uh, particularly the ones of the 19th century, which were built to last, which were built when industrialists tended to invest more in the buildings than in the machines they sheltered, these buildings throughout Europe and in North America and elsewhere have, so, have shown that they are capable of economies of energy and have shown that they can be adapted to a huge range of new uses. Once again, when, we, when, we, when these operations are undertaken, we simply have to hope that the values, the heritage values are not removed, but the economic and environmental values are nowadays crucial considerations. Hope to see you soon, Miles. <laughs> <laughs> um, one question I will very quickly respond myself from Mark Watson. Does the European Heritage Labour overlap or complement Europa Nostra uh, awards or do the two programs have separate objectives? A magnificent book, by the way. The, these are two different programs. 
And I would very much encourage everyone here who is with us today, have a look at Europa Nostra Award. It's an amazing award given on a beautiful uh, ceremony, uh, very prestigious internationally. Please consider submitting your, I, I know we have lots of representatives from different organizations, consider submitting your project. Uh, if you have, I used to be on, I'm not anymore, I used to be on jury of these awards. There are different categories. If you want to cons consider submitting your project, you have any doubts, please come, you, you are very welcome to contact me directly and I will do my best to help. Now, another question from, ah, we have a very nice comment from Pierre Lacombe, uh, who has said, uh, who is a chairman of the Europa Nostra Industrial and Engineer Committee and who said, may I pay a special word of congratulations to the people who made the book possible and um, we have another question from Bursa Altinsai, who said, ah, sorry, it is, thanks for the inspiring talk and images. Is Mr. Smith in a converted industrial building at the moment? That will be a quick question. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I, I, I don't know, uh, Joanna didn't say, I live in Paris and um, the, the the house I live in, which uh, I can't I can't show much of it here, but is it is in fact a former artist's studio in the 14th arrondissement. It's not an industrial building, but it's um, it's got an original space. I would be only too pleased to live in a in a loft, as they're called in French, a former industrial building. But the uh, my, my, my means don't stretch to that. May I just also say a word of thanks since you mentioned his name, Mark Watson. Uh, uh, a hello to Mark Watson, uh, who was also, along with Miles, a very um, uh, a very generous uh, contributor to the success of this book in finding photographs and information about some of the uh, the sites in Scotland, uh, and also, of course, to Pierre Lacan, to Pierre who is the president of uh, the uh, Europa Nostra Industrial and Engineering Heritage Committee uh, and who was uh, the driving force behind this publication along with our colleagues uh, at the uh, at the Uni Danube University in Krems. Huh? Um, Joanna. Yes, okay, last question because we will finish in three minutes. A question from okay. Pani Vani, and I trust Priyanka talks to us from India. Uh, thank you for the interesting lecture. I visited the Tate Modern Museum in 2013 and wished there was more about its industrial past. I'm not sure how much has changed since then. Do you think the locals can persuade the museum to include a section on history? Um, I, I, um, I, I'm not quite sure I understood the question. The question is whether the Tate Modern pays due attention to yes, its industrial I past. I believe yes. so. Yes. Um, no, I, I, I don't think so. I think I probably made it clear that uh, the Tate Modern, because of its industrial past, has this absolutely remarkable space, the Turbine Hall, a remarkable space that had a, a contemporary architect suggested building a space like this for a modern art museum, it would have been refused out of hand as being too expensive and with no real uh, function. The fact that it was an industrial space and could be kept for four new artistic uses was a, a key point in, in, in the whole operation of keeping Tate modern. The difficulty in my view was that um, indeed, when you visit the Tate modern today, Really, you have to go to the bookshop if you want to find out something about to the power station's past. You have to look it up. And the same is true, as I suggested, for the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, where you can visit the museum without understanding that it used to be a railway station. In my view, when an industrial building is uh, restored and rehabilita rehabilitated, and adapted for a new use, there should always be a piece of interpretation, a corner of interpretation, not necessarily a museum, but at least a, a little part which is devoted to explaining what this building was, what used to be made here, 
why it, has, it is seen as important today to keep this building, one or two of the examples in our, in our, in our book, the Tour and Taxis Royal Entrepôt in particular in Belgium, has a small museum section which explains why this new building, which has new office and commercial uses, was an important part of the uh, Brussels uh, industrial landscape. And I think in all cases, there's nothing official about it, but in all cases, 1% of the budget should be devoted to explaining the past, and not, not in a way that is obligatory, not making it into a museum, but at least for the people who are interested, they don't necessarily have to go to a bookshop or to a website to understand the past. The interpretation is there for them. And this is a plea that I often make uh, when, it, when it comes to transforming industrial buildings in France, but it's a difficult one and one that um, is not often heard. Anyway. That will be, we did, we have heard you and we have many, many people in the audience here who may actually help to make it happen. Um, let me thank you, Paul, once more. We've been in enormously lucky and privileged to have you today to take us through so much with such an exciting, such okay. a way. I would also like to thank Grace Connolly for helping us to set up this uh, this seminar and also to Peter Ovenstone for inspiring it. Um, I would uh, at the end like to draw attention of everyone to Europa Nostra Award, Heritage Europa and Heritage Awards. Uh, please visit the website. Grace put the link kindly into the chat. Uh, consider submitting your ama the amazing work you are doing and making it a little better, even better known. Um, then our next talk will be in a month time on the 14th April, also at the same time, 3 to 4 p.m. UK time. And it will be still uh, related with industrial heritage. Professor Jonka Erkan will talk to us about the traces of British industrial entrepreneurs in the late Ottoman Empire. I hope that you will be able to join us again. And until then, please consider joining Europa Nostra and stay well. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody.